I'm Joe DeGrazia. Um, some of you may have received emails from me at various points regarding today. Um, and I just want to start out by thanking everyone for coming. Um, a lot, some people have come quite a distance to be here today. Um, and thank you to those people for traveling. Um, and thank you to everyone else for coming as well. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit about what we envision for this event and why we organized it. Um, there's been a lot of com like conferences and events in the area of computational social science lately. And these tend to focus on things like digital trace data, um, methods of analysis for this data, and so-called big data, and things like algorithms and machine learning. And this event, we're looking at taking a slightly different approach to this topic. Um, we're looking at not so much methods here in terms of analysis, but more about how people think about ways to measure social science concepts using forms of data that have recently become available thanks to emerging technologies, um, including the internet and communications technologies, but also other types of technologies as well. So we have people here who are using um, like UAVs and drones or the analysis of photography. And so we're trying to take a broad look at how we can think about ways to measure concepts in social science using these, two new, these kinds of new technologies. And so we have the presentations today divided into three themes. Um, the first set of presentations are going to be looking at using digital trace and, and data from communications technologies or that have been either produced by people's use of these technologies or recently made available by them. Um, and so this research will look at how to collect this data, how to analyze it, and the types of theoretical innovations that can come from this type, of, this type of data. So we have Andrew Martin here, whose work looks at how public records of public petitions, um, can be, which have recently been made available in digital form online, can be used to form the basis of sampling activists in protest movements, a group of people that it has been notoriously difficult to sample. Um, Brian Keegan's work looks at the potential utility of data from socio-technical systems, in this case Wikipedia, um, to understand social processes, um, like distributed work in, in his case. Um, James Kitz's work um, examines how interactional data produced by people's use of communications technology can be used to conceptualize network connections in terms of interaction dynamics rather than um, ways that it has been in the past in terms of relational dynamics. Uh, the second set of presentations we'll have today tend to are using visual or photographic data. Um, so we have two presentations in this group. Uh, Kess Shore and Nisha Kodamon will be uh, using the analysis of photographs to understand how the shape of children's toys has changed over time and what we can learn about uh, social and cultural processes from this. And um, Britta Ricker, who will be giving our second presentation in this group, is looking at how we can harness the public's use of UAVs to collect uh, video and photographic data. And finally, in our last set of presentations, we'll be looking at how we can use archival and text-based data in social science. And so we'll be having two presentations in this as well. Our first presentation from Michael Evans will look at, in a fairly mysteriously titled paper, we'll look at how other people's processes of dealing with data um, that we encounter can influence conclusions that we draw from this data in our analyses of it. Um, and finally, Caitlin Birch will be giving our final presentation talking about how um, online archiving can be useful for social science research. Um, so um, if we want to get started with our first presentation, um, Andrew Martin will be coming up. And Thanks, Joe, for organizing this conference. I'm excited to be here. Um, the work I'm going to be presenting on is work that um, I'm doing with a few colleagues, one Craig Jenkins who is also at, in the sociology department at Ohio State, uh, Rachel Durso who just finished her PhD last year and is now at Washington College, and then Matt Sturmer who just defended his dissertation a few days ago and is uh, working for the um, Department of Health in, in Columbus. So the project that I'm talking about is, it's the, what I'm talking about today is a little bit of a, uh, just sort of a sliver of a sort of a larger data collection project where we're looking at um, 
the role of social media and political activism um, and sort of the linkages between online and offline activism to try to get at this sort of um, idea of how important online activism is, what the role of it is, and how it relates to offline activism. And we do it through an analysis of two uh, ballot initiatives that happened in, in Ohio in 2011, and I'll talk a little bit about those uh, initiatives in a little bit um, and sort of describe them in more detail. But right now, uh, the goal of the current research is to uh, figure out a way to identify a representative sample of activists or try to identify like what types of people are engaging in political activism. And there's a couple of different options um, that we can use, but they all have some challenges associated with them. So the first is uh, to ask organizations and groups that engage in social movement style activism to uh, share their lists of uh, individuals. Um, but this is tricky because organizations uh, may not want to for a variety of reasons. Uh, privacy issues, um, they may risk alien supporters, supporters when like appreciating getting like a, a survey request from, from someone like me. Um, and also um, it's very proprietary, so it's valuable. So a lot of these organizations collect um, very valuable information. So the Obama campaign, they have like a really sophisticated voter database that um, they've been sort of hesitant to share even with other, um, other groups. Um, so they, there's that sort of challenge and there's a bit of suspicion about how outsiders might use it. And also um, when, if you're sending out a lot of emails to these, to these individuals, uh, they make it marked as spam, so they, they actually may never actually see the, the emails from the organizations. And um, we, uh, just as sort of an aside, we approached, uh, there was, there's, there's issues on, there's, there's both a conservative and a liberal issue that I'll be talking about. Uh, one of these petitions was conservative, one was more liberal. Um, and we approached a couple of different groups, and they were sort of hesitant to um, share their, their data. In fact, like the, um, the local Republican Party, the, the, the main person who was sort of in charge of it was more open to it, but the person who actually maintained the database was like, no, no way. There's no way I'm sharing these data with you. So um, that's a challenge as well. Um, another, another option is to just do a, a general survey of the, of the population. But the challenge with that is that activism is, is relatively rare. Um, so about 5% you know, of, of people in the United States attend a political rally. So it, you're not going to get a lot of people even if you do a sort of a large, a large sample. So generally what social movement scholars have done in the past is just focus just on activists themselves. Um, so looking at just the people who are engaging in political activism um, and also the organizations that are involved in them. Um, but really, if you want to understand the difference between those who participate at different levels and those who don't, you have to have a representative samples that include both participants and non-participants. Obviously, just sampling participants is, again, sampling on the dependent variable, and that there causes all sorts of problems. So if you're really interested in what makes people politically active, um, you obviously need people who aren't politically active to look at. Um, and so our sort of starting point is thinking about, okay, well, one of the ways in which people engage in political activism, sort of the simplest way, is through signing a petition. So uh, based on the World Values Survey, that estimate says that about six, between 60 and 80 percent of individuals in Western democracies will at some point in their life sign a political petition. Um, the n number for the United States is 70 percent. So what we're doing is we're focusing our survey energy on this lowest form of political activism and so how that can sort of gain insight into differences that drive higher levels of political activism. So our sort of baseline is individuals who are signing petitions and we can then look up and sort of expand upwards and see like how people who engage in more, more sort of um, intensive forms of activism, how they're different from people who are just signing petitions, which again is something that is fairly common um, in the United States. So again, one of our, um, our possible solution here is to generate a sample from those who assign petitions um, and, and, and look at it that way. So most states do have some, some option that allow um, voters to decide legislation and, and constitutional issues, recall elected officials, or uh, bring referendum to the general public. And there's some, there's some different options here. Um, so uh, 27 states have some sort of direct initiative. So on this graph, if you're, the states that are in blue, orange, or yellow are states that allow some sort of direct initiative. Um, and then that, that number, I think this is um, old. I think it's even expanded further. So there's even more states that are allowing this type of, type of activism. OK, so, so some studies have used this political peti uh, public petition data, but no studies have really used it as a source of generating a sample. So we're really what our, our sort of approach is that we believe it's kind of a happy medium. It, it, it is not 
focusing strictly on activists who engage in high-level forms of activism like um, attending political rallies, but it's also not just, if we just look at the general population again, uh, people that don't engage in any types of uh, political activity. So it's sort of, that, sort of that balance between the two. It's a minimal level of political activity, but it's not uh, a particularly restrictive form. And I'm assuming you know, most of us in this room have signed political petitions at one point or another in our lives, and it's, you know, it's a relatively low-risk uh, form of activism. So when we're thinking about it, we thought about, okay, what are the pros and cons of using petition data? The first is that there is a lot of information on that uh, on the petition. The signers include their full name um, and their address so that the Secretary of State can validate their signature. Um, and I was just thinking about this last night. I don't know, like for some of these in ballot initiatives, they generated hundreds of thousands of signatures. Whether or not the Secretary of State offices actually checks all the names, I would be, I don't know, I don't think they would, but who knows. Um, and anyway, that's something I I'm sort of interested in looking into. Um, so we can, if you have that address data, you can use it and you can collect other data on those individuals. You can do surveys, obviously, but you can also use secondary or some um, for purchase uh, data sources, which I'll talk about later, to collect other information. They're also available um, publicly. So there was a Supreme Court uh, case, Doe versus Reed, um, which allowed um, uh, Secretary of State's offices disclosing. Uh, these names to individuals who request them, and they ruled that it didn't, invo didn't violate individuals' free speech rights. Uh, the other nice thing about uh, these public petitions data is that since they've expanded, there's been a variety of different issues that people have signed petitions about. Um, law enforcement, marijuana legislation, taxes, transportation issues, same-sex marriage, labor laws, minimum wage, environmental issues, health and health concerns, gun rights, natural resources, military veteran affairs, ethics and campaigns, lobbying, constitutional measures. These are all things, so like Ohio alone has a number of these. There was a constitutional amendment to allow uh, 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 people to build uh, gambling, casinos, marijuana legislation, all sorts of things. They require a large number of signatures, so it has a large end for sampling. Um, and generally, I won't go into the details of this, but generally most, in order to bring a ballot initiative to the public, you have to have a certain percentage of individuals sign the petition. And those, those percentages are usually based on maybe the number of people who vote in the last gubernatorial election or in the last presidential election. And some states will require that you don't just focus on urban areas, that there has to be a balance of petitions drawn from rural and urban counties. Um, and so, for example, North Carolina number of signatures must be equal to 2% of the population and for initiatives and 4% of the population over the age of 18 for constitutional amendments. Some of the cons, though, associated with this is that not all states keep uh, digital records of their petitions. Um, in our case, one was digitally archived and one, the other one wasn't. It's unclear how long people, how long states maintain these records. Um, and again, also how representative they are. So some st the states do vary in terms of how represented they expect these uh, petitions to be. And generally, the, um, you know, the concern is are we underrepresenting rural areas when we use these public petitions? Like in Ohio, there is some expectation that you have a certain percentage of your signatures from rural areas, but um, not all states may have that. So we're testing the possibility of using public petition data. Um, and we look at two, uh, ref uh, one referendum initiative and one constitutional amendment in Ohio in 2011. So the referendum initiative um, was regard it's called Proposition 2 or Issue 2. And in, um, so if so those of you familiar with sort of working class politics, in 2011, Ohio, Indi I think Indiana and Wisconsin passed laws that really restricted public sector collective bargaining rights. Um, in those states. And in Ohio, it was called Senate Bill 5. So it passed in the early of 2011, and obviously there was a pretty significant backlash to that, um, and unions and other liberal groups uh, held a, a petition drive to have the law overturned in the, in the uh, November election. Okay. And the other issue that we look at was Proposition 3, which was a constitutional amendment to opt out of Affordable Care Act or Obamacare. So this was organized by uh, Tea Party groups, Koch brother type funded groups to put on the ballot that Ohio, that Ohio would not have to participate in the Affordable Care Act. Um, this did gen not generate as much interest, probably in part because it was sort of a moot point, federal law, Trump state law, so it didn't matter if Ohio opted out of it, we still have to be part of it. Um, but both of these, um, about two million signatures were collected. M uh, most, the majority of them were collected by the Proposition 2 people. Um, that was a really large petition drive, but enough were collected by Prop 3 to also have um, 
and then put on the, on, the, on the ballot. And they both passed by about 60%. So we have this nice case of a conservative issue, Proposition 3, and a liberal issue, Proposition 2. And we sort of look at, um, we can look at the difference between the two. Okay, so the data that we use, um, we petitioned data was obtained from the Secretary of State's office in Columbus. Uh, the Prop 3 were available via CD-ROM. Uh, petition data for Senate Bill 5 had to be collected in person. We sent, we had a bunch of undergrads working for us. They would go down to the, the Secretary of State's office. Uh, we selected counties through a stratified sample. Um, and so we wanted to, so we sort of ranked counties on how large they were and divided between ur urban and rural areas. Um, and we selected the 12 highest um, uh, urban and rural areas or er, participating in this. So we had an, a, a balance between these two, these two, um, these two counties. Um, one of the challenges with the petition data is that it, it presents a couple of sampling challenges. So we know that petitions are collected at specific times and places. So someone might stand outside the library. So they're going to collect people who go to the library on a particular day. And that might bias, obviously, the results because there's some autocorrelation there in terms of the types of people who are likely to attend or go to the library on a weekday or on a weeknight or whatever it might be. Um, and obviously, if two people that know each other go, you know, husband and wife go or partners go, they're going to sign right after each other. And so if you're selecting both those people, you're going to have some overlap as well. So rather than just selecting a random sample of cases, we pulled the first and last signature from each page um, from a different address and a different last name. So if there are all these pages of petitions, the first person on that page and the last person on that page. Um, we also entered the addresses into a database to look at their geographical dispersion. Um, we also, the other advantage of this is if you're the first person or the last person, there's likely to be a little bit more temporal uh, variability in terms of, um, of when they're signing. We also controlled, so we, I'm not going to show these results here, but we controlled for the circulator, um, the person who was collecting data. So we think that certain types of circulators may, uh, you know, that might bias the results a little bit. So we controlled, we, we recorded their name and controlled for that. And we, like I said, we oversampled rural populations. Okay, so. The survey, uh, we used the address by the petition. We, we had a cover letter we sent out to individuals uh, that provided contact information for the respondents. We got some people requesting information. Survey had a start and close date. It was a, uh, a, a web address that they would go to. There was a unique code that the individuals would enter. So you, can't, you couldn't duplicate the survey. Once you entered it and entered your survey, you were, you were done. Um, Based on similar studies, we assumed that there would be about a 2% response rate for these types of surveys. So uh, sort of a cold call ma or a mail survey that gets sent out uh, that, that has a web uh, response rate generally is about 2%. There was a, over, like I said, over, um, there's too many signatures gathered, over 1.5 were uh, legitimate. Um, we estimated that we needed to look at a single population parameter, like the difference between urban and rural areas. We needed at least 500. Um, Respondents, we had collected petition signature addresses from 25,000 people. So our sample of people, or our, we collected data on 25,000 people from the petition data, and we used that as our, our, our sample population. Um, we ended up sending uh, surveys out to, from those 25,000, 18,762 individuals. Um, and we estimated to have a margin, uh, a margin of error of 3.5%. We needed uh, 783 responses. And for a 2.5% margin of error, we needed 1,534 responses. Um, in the end, we got 6.3% of the sample, or 1,182 total, res total uh, survey responses. Um, we offered football tickets as an incentive. And in Ohio, st in Ohio that's a pretty good, that's what the best incentive you're going to use. So the biggest, the biggest uh, thing we got calls on was whether or not the person had completed the survey in time to be entered in the drawing for the football tickets. That was the biggest concern for these things. Um, so we had about a 6.3 overall response rate, um, which is, again, higher than the 2% response rate we were sort of thinking of. And um, so we were relatively pleased with that, um, that, that result. OK, so one of the things we're really interested in is how the people who respond to the survey are different from the people who actually didn't respond to the survey. So that was our really one of the big interests here is looking at those difference between those two groups of individuals. And so what we did was we purchased data, uh, data from Experian. Experian's a credit uh, rating uh, agency um, to, to, look at, to collect some data on the people who did not return the survey. So all you need, if you ever do this, is you need the <coughs> address of the name and address of the individual. We had, uh, we had um, and we, collect, we bought 
for we took a sample of 1,207 non-respondents for issue two and 999 respond non-respondents for issue three. Uh, had an Excel spreadsheet. You just it takes very it's very easy to go to Experian and get these data. Uh, I think I was trying to remember the amount of money. It might have been a couple thousand dollars to collect data on these individuals. And in Experian, you can collect it either. Uh, sort of like um, a la carte, like individual variables, or you can do, they do like different packages. Obviously, these are for they're primarily targeting marketers who want to collect data on you know purchasing behaviors and things like that. There's you know it's a little disturbing to see how much information you can get on a person just by having their name and address. You can get a lot of data on them. Um, so what I want to do now is just really quickly go through and sort of show you how respondents differ from non-respondents and sort of thinking about how this might matter for um, if we're going to use petition data to, to, to get at political activism. Um, so if the variable has an asterisk next to it, it means that the difference is significant, which unlike most times when we do data, collect, data analysis, in this case, it's a bad thing. So we don't want there to be significant differences between the respondents and the non-respondents. And so for Prop 2, there was not a significant difference in terms of the gender of the respondent or the race or the age. So um, you do see um, a bit of an over-response, for example, from older Americans in terms of, and older Ohioans in terms of their, their response. For Prop 3, sort of the same. No significant difference between um, men and women on race and on age as well. And I should note that overall Prop 3 individuals tended to be older. Uh, it was mainly Tea Party groups. Um, so they tended to skew a little bit more uh, older in terms of their participation. OK, there was a difference in terms of marital status on Prop 2. Um, married individuals are more likely to respond than, non than non-married. Um, unemployment is uh, was not significantly different. Income, there was a difference as well um, with older, with uh, sorry, um, uh, more affluent individuals having a higher a level of response, and that also held true for Prop Three with employment as well. Um, employed individuals tended to have a higher response rate than non-employed. Finally, in terms of education, no significant difference. Political affiliation, there was um, some difference in terms of responses for both Prop Two and Prop Three. One of the th issues is that income and political affiliation are things that are generally have a little bit more, um, people tend, don't tend to report them as accurately. So this is the two areas where we would kind of expect to see maybe some more differences because um, in terms of how people actually report these data. So, but overall though, I mean, these, these findings I think gave us some confidence that um, using petition data in the first place does allow us to sort of get at uh, political activism, and then the survey, which I'm not going to talk about today, um, has a lot of act questions about their online activism, their offline activism, and sort of how those two things connect and how they connect with other individuals uh, in terms of their, their political activism in this campaign. Um, and it also indicates that you know the, the, we're not just picking up, in, in terms of our response rate, just the, the most politically active, or there's not real significant differences in terms of a lot of the typical demographic characteristics. So we were pleased to see these, um, these results kind of holding our breath and make, hoping that there was not a lot of significant differences between the two, the two sets of individuals. So we kind of think, given especially, uh, like I said before, the range of political petition drives that are, are happening these days, um, and this sort of interest in surveying activists, that this is a, a potentially useful option for, for studying this type of behavior. Um, some of the limitations. Um, one thing that have, we have to be concerned about is if we're now collecting public, where you, if people know that when they sign a petition that some researcher like me is eventually going to like pull their name out and start studying them, there may be some chilling of signing those, those, those things if, if they feel like their privacy uh, is being violated. Again, the Supreme Court, legally we can do this, but you know, whether or not that affects people's uh, willingness to participate is something else. Um, people don't really know in its use. And, and then also, it varies pretty significantly across states in terms of how, you know, how detailed the records are, how, how accessible they are. In Ohio, it was pretty straightforward. Again, one of them was available electronically. The other one, we had to say, you know, if you have a cadre of undergraduate students, you can do a lot of this data collection. It's pretty straightforward. So um, yeah, that's the, so that's sort of the focus of this talk. And again, we're in, we're in the process of looking at a lot of the other data that we've collected, like the survey data. Um, we've also collected all the tweets uh, on both of these campaigns. 
a um, couple million tweets, and so we're, we're right now in the process of sentiment coding them. So that would also have been a good talk had that data been actually collected already, but it's just in the process of being analyzed right now. So, but thank you for your time. Oh, yeah. So we do questions? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so this is a big thing, and we talked about this last night. Um, I'm not sure how they estimate it. That's something because you're not really supposed to have that, but they do. So I don't know, and this is the thing that, again, the difference, one of the things we're wondering about is where they're getting it from, and that's where maybe some of this fuzziness comes into play. And what they're using. Oh, yeah. I mean, this is a credit bureau, right? Yeah, it's a credit bureau. But there are, it's, so the, well, they're part, they're a credit bureau, and they have a lot of other things. So when you go, when I bought it, you buy it from their small business division. So they're, mar they're also selling this, they're just selling it to, mark you know, to companies and marketing firms. So, and they, I mean, the, I should have, actually, I don't, I don't think I have it, but I should have brought the, the list of data you can collect. We can go on their website and look, the list of data you can purchase on people is pretty incredible and scary and, and from a social science perspective. <laughs> Great, yeah, <laughs> it's awesome. So, but yeah, so that was one that we're in, is a little bit more fuzzy. So, mm -hmm. so I, like, I really like the, the Experian piece of this, and I was just wondering if you had thought about, and I don't know if this is in sort of your, your wheelhouse or things you want to do for your research program, but if you thought about trying to reverse engineer, like how it is that they're kind of pulling out political affiliation, mm -hmm. if you have voter files, if you have sort of registration, right. things like that, <coughs> yeah. you know, other kinds of orthogonal, or potentially if they have everything, then nothing's more orthogonal. Like right, so right. That would be really interesting because, I mean, again, like some of them, like you look through the list and they have like, oh, they're in, are they interested in the environment? Okay, like wonder where they're getting that from. You know, they just have so much, uh, so much. Yeah, that would be really interesting to sort of see. The political affiliation one is definitely one that I'm, <coughs> excuse me, more curious about where they get from. But yeah, that would be really interesting to see how they get all the data. I worked in direct marketing for two years at okay. a local company called Nextmark, which uh, uh, aggregates mailing lists for magazine subscriptions. <coughs> and I would say that magazine subscriptions could be an inferred indicator of okay. environmentalism. Yeah, okay, that's what we were talking Yeah. So if you're subscribing to certain ones, you're. Yeah. So there's, there's all this data. You should assume that all data is available if it's not yet today. Yeah. Do you have a sense of how many social scientists are using? kind of experience data or other credit rating data for purchase just because it seems like it would be super useful if you're trying to think about political outcome, mm -hmm. localization, all the stuff that might vary across the county. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. Did, did Putnam use any of it for some of his work? I thought maybe. I wasn't sure. I, I have to go back and look. But I don't know if, t I don't know how, I mean, the, the, the probably the main limitation is this, it's pretty cost prohibitive if you're going to collect this on a large scale. And it's proprietary in terms of they won't tell you how it's constructed. You're right, yeah, that's the other thing. They're not, it's sort of a, I mean, you just go on there and you, s yeah, you just say, here we go, and they send you the data, and they're not going to say, like, yeah, how they got it. So, but it is, I mean, again, there's, <coughs> we just went through the list and a couple hundred variables and just kind of picked and choose what we want. And then, they, like I said, they group them into categories. So, you know, depending on what kind of interest. If you are interested in more political, getting a sort of political sample, you can do that, so. Um, I was recently on a panel about so social media and ethics, um, and would you find that this 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 type of data would come under the same type of ethical level as using social media data? Yeah, I think that's <coughs> when I'm trying to think back when we applied for our IRB. We yeah, this was sort of this because we did get Twitter data as well. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so I think. Yeah, it's, I mean, because you know, now you know their name and address, and um, I'm just trying to think back on how we did it, but it, would, it did sort of, was, we treated it very similar to, like, if we know their identity of the Twitter yeah. person. But it just seems like this, the Experian data, like, it's being co-opted covertly, whereas social media data, people are signing their so, terms. Yeah, there, yeah, there, yeah, because yeah. I know, like, on Twitter, you can decide to keep your identity private. private or not, and this one you can't. So it does, I mean, it is definitely like, I think a gray area. Yeah. But that, I mean, I feel like if marketers are using it, why shouldn't we right, use right, it? Right, 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 right. And I think, I think the big thing, I'm, I'm assuming in IRB, we you know, couldn't reveal our identity of any of the people that we had data on. And I think we, yeah, once we, once we had that other information, we matched it to the survey and then just destroyed the identifying information. But yeah, it's a new, new era.
Yeah. You said all about how high up it compared with the petition laws. Mm -hmm. How that compares to the other states. Is, is it the most permissive or is it somewhere in the middle? Or My sense is that Ohio, it's a good question, uh, skews a little bit more on the permissive end um, in terms of how easy it is to get things on the, on the ballot. Um, so right now what I'm doing, I should have, I don't have the website, but there is, it's, it's, there's a website that actually has every ballot initiative in the United States. Uh, if you email me, I'll, I'll find it. Um, and so I, right now I have a group of students coding that. So you can, you, they have it by local or state level. They have like, they, they created some categories, um, like what type of issue it is. And then they have a little description of the, of it. And then I'm having students right now code whether or not it's a sort of a more conservative or a liberal issue. Um, and I was just trying to think back, like some states that you'd think would have like high levels of political participation don't, in part because I think their 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 uh, the ability to do this is more restrictive. So like Wisconsin didn't do this. They had the recall of Scott Walker because I don't think they could actually engage in this type of just overturning the act, right? They couldn't. They don't have a public reference. Yeah, so they couldn't do this, whereas Ohio could. Um, I'm assuming California is pretty, most states I do think are, you know, there is a, this sort of, you have to have a certain percentage of people sign. There is, I think most states also have built in that you can't just, like in Ohio, if you just had to have a number of people sign, you would just go to Cleveland, Cincinnati, and Columbus, because that's where everybody is. Well, not everybody, but that's where most people are, and it's easy to collect all the data, and you wouldn't go to rural counties. But in Ohio, there is the expectation that a certain percentage of those people come from rural counties. That, so they have a more, yeah. So they look at the, yeah. Um, but I think, <coughs> like I said, Ohio definitely is more, more, um, more permissive. So, yeah. So, I was going to say, since you found some significant differences between the, <coughs> the non respondents and mm -hmm. the respondents using the data, yeah. when you do the analysis, are you going to um, use the. Yeah, I think we're going to try to, <coughs> yeah, use it a little bit to con wait for it. Sorry. <coughs> I think I have some granola in my throat. <laughs> um, <coughs> um, and one of the things we have to do is, again, with the, try to figure out this political, uh, the political affiliation and see how they're doing that. But we're going to try to work that in the model so we, you know, we might wait. Uh, like, again, in this data, um, people who earn less because they're a little underrepresented in terms of the response rate. So yeah, for sure. It is a nice way to check for that. Yeah. So I have, a, I have a suggestion and a question. OK, so perfect. First, the, the suggestion, I, I imagine that in petition data, there's a variety of forms of dependency and clustering and, and patterns of names that appear. Right. And my suggestion is, so, so the same is true in, in, in public health literature and statistics. They have a, there's a, a literature on chain referral samples where people uh, refer their friends or people they know to, and they're included. Mm -hmm. And there's a, there's a pretty good literature on the question of representativeness and mm -hmm. what are the conditions mm. under which you can Include that your sample is representative in a chain referral sample. So I just suggest uh, oh, yeah. engaging that. Yeah, yeah. It would be a, a line into into you know a further broader discussion of the issue. Of representative. Yeah, that'd be really interesting. Yeah. Uh, so then, then my then my question. So I was I was a, I was a door to door canvasser and a petitioner who would go around events and, and okay. collect petitions. If I could naively remember and guess the patterns that I would see is that when I went door to door, there was probably an even distribution of male versus female respondents. And when I went to events and selected my own people I talked to, I think, I confess, I think there were probably a lot of women when I was 18, a lot of young women who, who, uh, I, who, okay. I, uh, who I collected uh -huh. and surveyed. And so uh, this leads me to, to ask if, do you have data on your petitioners? Do you have data on, on the, for which there may be discretion mm -hmm. that's involved mm -hmm. and could be implicated in your yeah. clustering or right. dependencies? No, we, so we know, we do know who the circulator, who the petition gatherer is. And right now in our models, we're just controlling, like, you know, we have a, there's not a large number of them, so we control for that. But this would be really interesting to see, like, does it matter in terms of, because we could look here and see, does it matter? Do they, does this non, you know, does it differ in terms of? Um, do you see an interviewer effect? Do you see a yeah. difference in mm -hmm. whoever's Yeah. Population? So we started to look into it a little bit, but that's a great point. And we're, I th yeah, so thinking about the gender thing is, Something you could probably infer, yeah. And I don't know, yeah, well, the, actually, the, the, I think that you have to register with a secretary in Ohio. If you're gathering signatures, you have to register with the Secretary of State's office and maybe provide them some basic information so we could use those data. And then, because we know who, 
who collected these signatures and used that. So that'd be interesting. Yeah. Photographs. You need photographs. Yes. Some, some people, I don't care how pleasant they are in asking you, I'll look at them. <laughs> we can rank them. Right. Like, <laughs> would you would you sign a petition by this person? <laughs> no. So the address data seems like an interesting source of variation too for these petitions, mm -hmm. right? So you might imagine that if you were in closer proximity to like a shutdown manufacturing plant, you might be more sensitive to these kinds of issues. Yeah. These kinds of propinquity kinds mm -hmm, of measures. Mm -hmm. and so I was just wondering, like, if you had thought about kind of bringing any of that, and not for like the representatives this question, but in terms of like for the propensity to sort of yeah. support these things based on sort of geospatial. Yeah. So we started playing a little bit with the the like because we do know where they live, so a little bit of the geospatial data, and I think we're going to start collect. We've been doing it with Twitter on some of the ones that have been have uh, been geotagged, but for this as well, in terms of thinking about. Yeah, where are they living and like what, what affects, again, the survey data has all sorts of things on their political participation. So we're trying to collect some county level, or I mean, I think even probably more, more fine grained than that data on like unemployment and things like that. So that's something that we've been starting to, to play around with. Any other questions? Well, thanks everyone, I appreciate it.